So it should be an interesting hour or even hour and a half. Um, <clears throat> as mentioned, you can uh, include all of your questions in the questions box and we will answer them at the end of the webinar. Um, we've had good discussions before, so let's hope there will be a lot of questions this time as, as well. Cool. I think the latecomers, this is very Finnish way to do this, <laughs> the latecomers have had one minute time to join, so it's, uh, no, well, two minutes. So then uh, let's start. Go ahead, advice we we are ready to go. Hello, uh, good afternoon, and welcome to our forward mapping clinic. My name is Awais Hassan. Yeah, so if uh, you have missed our previous uh, mapping clinics, so previously we have already covered uh, mapping with smartphones, uh, like a VLK to go scanning, uh, map editing features, a uh, feature like uh, how you can download and edit a map and upload it again and uh, real-time mapping, and also the Polycan pipeline, it was covered by Mauling. So if you need any, uh, if you want to ask any question regarding these topics, you can ask in this session, and, or you can send us a message in Discord or send us an email, or if you have missed these topics, you can go to our YouTube channel and you can uh, see previous three mapping clinics regarding these topics. So we shall start with our fourth mapping clinic today. So the, uh, for today's topic, uh, we will cover frequently asked questions uh, related to mapping for different devices and locations. And uh, later on, uh, in the second half, uh, Maolin will cover 360 camera pipeline. So uh, we get this question asked a lot that uh, can we uh you know support stationary scanners like blk 360 matterport faro or some other lidar scanners uh, some you know some companies have built their own scanners or some uh, some companies have uh purchased already some scanners so we get uh, get asked this question a lot that uh, can we support in different scanners so we will cover in depth uh you know use cases of those and then you can figure out that is it a good way to uh, scan with those or not. So, yeah. So, uh, yeah, those devices often take, uh, you know, high quality 360 images, and we could definitely use them. Uh, it is also possible to get the, the camera pose, like position and orientation of the image that are from them. So technically, uh, yes, we can use those devices if they provide us with good quality images and camera poses. So technically we can support them, but then uh, the question is, is it a good idea to do it? Well, not really, unless you have a very good reason and very clear understanding that what you are doing. So let's quickly, uh, understand that how those devices work and how they are different from iPhone BLK to go or 360 camera pipeline. Uh, sorry, yeah. So uh, for iPhones uh, and other smartphones uh, that we support have ARK, AR Core, or similar solutions to track the device pose over time. So uh, we need a lot of images and it is easy and fast for a user to capture those with smartphones. Uh, as the user moves around and captures images, uh, it also captures process data and it is uh, what we use. And for blq to go uh, also uh, captures a lot of images in th three, uh, with three different cameras in different directions, simultaneously, automatically, and tracks the camera poses in real time as the user moves around. And uh, once uh, you upload a single B2G scan to our cloud and we get accurate po uh, poses from the file. So it is the quickest way. So in comparison to uh, with blg to go now we will uh, cover the other devices. Then you can, uh, keeping in mind these uh, comparisons, then you can decide that is it a good idea or not. So uh, process for stationary scanners. 
So first of all, you have to set up the device on a tripod and take a scan. The device always like stays in a place, rotates around uh, in its vertical axis and captures bubble of uh, uh, points with LiDAR from that position. With blk go you move around quickly and you take the scan. But with this one, you have to set up the tri uh, tripod at one place and start scanning. Then you pick it up, move to another location, and then repeat the process. And you have to do it multiple times. So once you have scanned it, uh, you use uh, software to register or align the scans. The scanners often don't have a tracking solution. So the individual scanner scans have no idea where they were taken in relation to one another. So uh, you need to align all the scans. Uh, and this is why you need some overlap between the different scans. And you might even want to use physical target objects to uh, make the process easy and automatic. Once the scans are aligned, you have both 360 images and camera poses, which could, in theory, use for our uh, cloud service. So, uh, because we don't, we have both things like images and the camera poses. But and how does the stationary scanner work? Uh, BLK360 Faro or other custom-made stationary scanner have been developed for a very different use case. You know, the primary use case of those devices is to provide higher resolution colored point cloud of a target location. And you take as few scans from that location as possible uh, to make sure all details are captured uh, and the person then process the scan in some software. So because this is, is mainly used for surveying, so you, you don't need necessarily a lot of overlap. But for our technology, you need a lot of overlap. So you take as few scans as possible with these scanners. So uh, then you take scans to, you know, uh, every part of the location, uh, and that is only uh, you take in scans in such a way that they are seen only once with minor overlap between different scans. And with our cloud service, you need to see scan uh, the same visual features from different viewpoints, uh, and you need to have a lot of overlap between the images. So this is the main difference that how uh, different they work. So the, let's come to the problem. What's the problem? The problem with the station scanner scanners is not that we cannot use the data. Yes, as I said previously, we can use it. Uh, it's that the prop, uh, process is slow. And uh, this really depends on the specific hardware, but each station scan takes from 10 seconds to one minute to up to few minutes. Like it depends on uh, depends on every scan you scan. Like you have to set up the tripod, keep it one place, then uh, start the scan, stop the device, then keep it on other, place it on other, and, and another point, and then repeat the process. So it is time taking. On the other hand, BLK to go, you just uh, have to pick up the scanner and just walk around. And scanning with, with stationary scanners can be uh, 10 times slower than a BLK to go, assuming you only need the minimum amount of data for geometry serving purpose, not for visual positioning. So uh, that is compared like uh, comparison to like just for serving purposes, it is 10 times slower. But if you need uh, to manually register the scans, uh, Order manufacturer a specific uh, scanning with a stationary can be 100 times slower because you have to manually, you know, register the process and so. So uh, if you want to want it to take uh, enough scans uh, for VPS, then uh, it could e easily uh, be between 10 to 100 times slower. So I will explain this in my next slide. For example. How, how, why I'm saying that it could be like up to 100 times lower or 10 times lower. In the first image, you can see uh, this is a normal survey of a custom scanner or BLK360. So you just take this green dot. Uh, you just, uh, this is a map of a house or a flat. 
So you just place the scanner at one place and you scan a place. Then you move to another one, you set it up again and again and repeat the process uh, until it has a minor overlaps and you have mapped all the area. But on the extreme right, you have a BLK to go scan. You enter from one place, you walk around just holding the scanner and you just uh, capture a few point uh, from every point of view and you capture a lot of images and then you just exit it from the same place so it will complete the loop while capturing a lot of images so this is how our pipeline works like you can capture it with blk to go or maybe you can uh, take it with cell phone so but you have to cover a lot of viewpoints but in order to do it with blk 360 or other surveying tools uh, you need to place your device at every few feet or centimeter, I would say, depending on uh, in, in what way you are capturing. For example, the middle image is what you can use BLK360 or other serving tools to capture uh, other stationary devices to capture uh, a map for a missile. You have to take a lot of images and uh, you have to set it up. So that is what uh, proves our previous point that it could be from 10 to 100 times slower or compared to BLK to go. Because for BLK to go, it will hardly take maybe five minutes to walk through in detail. But in here, it will take at least one minute for each scan. So it can take one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven minutes over here. So it's already slower normal serving. So when you use it for, uh, you know, uh, 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 this normal serving tool with for uh, VPS, it, it's going to take a lot of time. So uh, in comparison uh, to BLK to go and uh, other cameras, I have covered almost all the all the you know uh, points. So you can compare your custom device. Uh, that is it good idea to map with BLK to go or a mapper app, or is it good to map with other devices? So the, the, another question pops up uh, many times uh, that how to map a city skyline. Uh, for example, we have like a, a couple of quest times questions asked that, okay, we want to create some educational tool or uh, some uh, for for our guests in a hotel or uh, some other stuff, like they want to just capture uh, city skyline and display some content on, uh, content on it. So I will uh, tell you the basics of it, and then you can uh, match some combination and do the math uh, how it will work. So consider always consider how much does the scan change when you step back. Close up targets needs more viewpoints in shorter distance. Far away targets do not change when uh, that much when you move. So uh, viewpoints needs to be at longer distances. For example, on the left hand side, we have a small building that is a Lego tower or a house or something like that. So once you have placed this in room, so you will have to capture, you know, uh, pictures from few centimeters from to up to a few feet in uh, uh, around that object. So the viewpoint will be changing quickly and it will have enough parallax and you can capture a good scan. But in comparison to the city skyline, if you move, the skyline is not changing a lot. So there are very little to no features changing. So little parallax will not create good features. So the scan will be not good enough, will not be good enough, yeah. So now comes the next point. So as you know that minimum three viewpoints are required for a feature. You can have more, that's better, and uh, have distance uh, between viewpoints to create parallax. So it is mandatory for the parallax to create at least at least three viewpoints. So mapping a skyline, you should have more than three, of course, uh, viewpoints, and you can take images in between. So, and uh, here is an example. For example, to capture a grid map, you must have overlap and grid parallax, minimum three viewpoints to capture a feature. 
uh, Skyline, for example, that image that I showed you in uh, the previous slide, the skyline looks like maybe 500 meters to 1,000 meters away. Uh, so the distance between two pro or viewpoints should be at least 30 to 40 meters apart. Because if you, uh, let's say, move 10 feet or 20 feet, uh, the viewpoint, the view is not changing a lot. So uh, the map will be map map will not create enough features. So it, it, it will be hard to create a map. So you have to walk a lot. And you can add more viewpoints to create better parallax. So the, I have like created a, a, a small drawing. I'm sorry for my drawing is not good enough, but it, it, will, it will help you to understand it. So let's say you are at a rooftop or you are at the ground. So we have like different scenarios, but the sky, of course, if you want to see a skyline, you have to be at some distance. So uh, these uh, green dots are the viewpoints that, uh, and e for each viewpoint, there should be at least 30 to 40 meter, even 30, 25 meter is fine. If it's like 500 meters away, 25, uh, up to 25 meter or 20 meter distance is fine, but it's better to have uh, more viewpoints at a farther distance. And you should also take images in between these points. Like you can take maybe, uh, five to ten images uh, between these points to, uh, of course, because you have more data and it will create a better map and better for uh, the map quality. So these were the two main questions we were asked. And also there is a, a, a random question that mapping a stadium, because uh, uh, as you have seen that uh, around, there are a lot of applications around stadium use cases on social media. And so we get asked uh, this question a lot that can we map uh, a stadium with a Mersal? Yes, of course you can. And we have, of, uh, most of our, our clients have mapped the stadiums and we have different use cases. You can look at our social media like LinkedIn. Uh, we have, we frequently share uh, videos from our, our customer. So how do you map a stadium? So for a stadium, uh, usually you are uh, mapping for the audience. So you can walk around these staircase in, in the circle and also these stairs. So, uh, and basically you can walk, uh, a user could be on maybe on the top stair, like, you know, uh, top level of stairs or maybe at the bottom of level of the stairs. So you should have uh, multiple viewpoints, like you have to walk all these stairs around it. So it will create, uh, you know, a vertical and horizontal. Uh, walking factor and it will help a lot to create a good map and uh, yeah these are these were the main frequently asked questions if you have any questions you can ask in the chat and now my colleague uh, Maulin will cover the 360 camera pipeline for you thank you over to you Ma. Thank you, Avais. Um, Thank you, Avais. I'm, I just changed the, you, Marlin, for the presentation presenter. I hope it works now. Yes, we can see your screen. Thank you very much, Avais. That was very interesting to hear about the frequently asked questions. I have a few questions, but I will save them for the end and let Mao start now. Go ahead. Okay, um, let me share my slide first. One second, what happened? Just a second. Makes you very uh, credible presenter when we can see, you know, rows of code there. <laughs> Those you cannot see on my yeah. screen. Are you seeing two screens or one screen? Yes, we are also seeing two two slides at the same time. Okay. I'm um, not sure you know, just how to help.
but yeah, we can look at that at like this as well. It's fine. Okay, that was good. All yes. right, I'm going to talk about our cameras, in other words, 360 cameras. Um, and this is, well, um, uh, actually, most of our customers, especially the customers in China, they are asking how to do it because this is kind of like a popular use case to use a 360 camera, especially consumer level 360 cameras. And but before before we go dive into that, I'd like to show you this uh, overview. And this is the overview which we usually show to some potential customers. And it uh, it has two rows. The first row on top shows that the method that we can support to do the mapping. And the second row shows the clients or the devices that we can support to do localization. And for the mapping method, you can see that there are from the left to right. The left one is uh, mobile devices. Uh, on mobile devices, we can support the mapper app, we can support Polycam, we can support 360 camera, we can support Lake be okay to go And today we're going to talk about how we support 360 camera. Uh, but before that, um, uh, there's a question uh, for how we can support 360 camera. But we need to start from mobile devices for be okay to go How do we support mobile devices, mapping with mobile devices, or mapping with be okay to go uh, As you know, that immersive server or let's say our backend, if you want to, our backend provides the REST API for map construction. If you want to start a map construction, you need two kinds of inputs. And you need the number one, you need the images. Number two, you need the camera pose. The camera pose means the position and rotation for the images, the position and rotation of the, uh, of the moment when the image was taken, uh, when the photo was taken. So we we need those two those two uh, inputs are are mandatory for map for map construction, and for mobile for mobile devices this is easy because usually for mobile devices you have SLAM, and for example for iOS devices you have ARKit which, which offer your SLAM, on uh, Android devices you have AR Core, so you have the camera pose also we have the images, problem solved. What about BLK to go? Um, BLK to go also also have images. And we take the images from three cameras from be able to go the one in in the middle, the one on left, one on right. And also be able to go has camera pose, which is from its LIDAR. And also especially this is a LIDAR from this is uh, the slam from the LIDAR. And the, the slam from LIDAR is very accurate and reliable. So for be able to go, you also have images and camera pose. So then you can just upload the images plus camera powers to immersive backend and you can get your map constructed. Problem solved. But what about uh, three sister cameras? Because the three sister cameras could be hard because it's just a camera. It's just a camera. It doesn't have a slam. It doesn't understand where it is. So, so the output of the camera is just uh, three sister videos or three sister images but you don't know the position and rotation when you take the images. So how do we solve this problem? Um, so we need to ha have some tools to figure out the camera pose. So the answer is SFM, Structure from Motion. So we need to use some photogrammetric software to calculate the camera pose so that it can be used for map construction. And one of the uh, popular tool is called MetaShape. Well, MetaShape is not the only choice. And as I said, that this is just one of the uh, photogrammetric software. And this is, uh, we provide a sample by using MetaShape. And so the whole process is like this. So in the beginning, you have the 360 camera. From the camera, you get a 360 video or 360 images. If it's 360 video, we need to get the frame, extract the frame from the from the video. And in the end, we also get images. And then we need to input the images into this photographic software, such as MetaShape. And from MetaShape, we can calculate the camera pose. And then we, we can do what we have been doing. We can just press, uh, convert, convert the camera pose and upload the camera pose and plus images to immersive backend 
and start map construction. And as a side effect, which is a good side effect, is that also from this uh, photogrammetric software, uh, you can also generate the mesh and uh, texture, which is the model, which, which you can use in Unity for adding AR content. So yeah, this is the overview of the uh, 360 pipeline. And for 360 pipeline, the, uh, the advantage the pros part is that um, usually 3 camera can be used for large spaces, especially outdoor large spaces, such as uh, street blocks or parks, and also for uh, the indoor spaces which have high seating, such as lecture hall or uh, warehouse or factories. Uh, but for, for some situation, it doesn't work that well, where let's say there are some better ways to map the space, such as office, such as uh, just normal height of the indoor environment. And uh, well, another pro part is the mapping is simple and efficient, because what you need to do is just hold up the camera and take a walk around, and that's it, which is, um, well, comparing to shooting, shooting pictures one by one, uh, uh, which is, uh, th this is much more efficient than that, right? So, and the third pro part is that, uh, as I said, in this, um, in this pipeline, you can also get a high quality mesh with texture generated from this photogrammetric software and for adding up your content for development. And the cons part is that, uh, well, there's no slam. So the slam is not there. So that means the camera pose is not really from uh, from the slam data. It's not really from measuring, but it's more like from com computation, and, and it's more like a estimated data. And uh, comparing to, for example, comparing to BRK to go, maybe it's not as uh, reliable or not as accurate as BRK to go. Okay. Um, how do we get started? To get started, first you need, you, you need to have a 3 sys camera uh, first. And uh, the model that we recommend so far, the best model that we, we, we recommend based on our test is this Insta360 One RS with one inch sensor. Actually, we don't have limitation for the models. As long as you, as long as it's a 3 sys camera, we can support it. But this one is, the, is so far the best one, the best model based on our test, because uh, resolution-wise, resolution it's about 6K. Well, if you take pictures, it's about 6.5K. And also, since this has one inch sensor, it's supposed, uh, the performance of low light support is very good. Uh, on the other side, we also uh, support other models, such as Insta360 uh, uh, X3, which supports 5,007K resolution. Also, GoPro Max. Well, GoPro Max is the only device which has GPS embedded. Uh, well, GPS is not mandatory in our pipeline, but uh, if you have GPS, that also means that you can you can check, uh, you can confirm and check if the walking path is aligned to the data from GPS. But it's not mandatory. And also, besides that, you need to have an immersive account, of course. Or you also, you need to have a photogrammetric software such as Metashape. And also need you need you need to have some scripts to for converting the data for uploading the data. You can use if you are using Metashape, you can use a sample from our from our end. Uh, also, you can develop yourself because the most important part is that you have the data and there's an immersive REST API. You can implement the uploading parts with whatever language you you, you are familiar with. And last but not least, uh, also maybe probably you need Mesh Lab or third-party uh, 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 point called editing tool. Well, this is optional. Well, and also this map editing has been uh, has been discussed in previous uh, mapping clinic. So, uh, well, there are a lot of text in this slide. Uh, here are some tips of the mapping. Uh, I don't want to read out all the text here. I can share the slides somewhere after the clinics, but I want to highlight something here. So basically, you have two choices. One is that you take you can take a 360 video. The second is that you can shoot uh, you can take pictures. But ideally, ideally taking pictures is better because taking pictures 
you have better resolution. For example, if you go with Insta360 RS one inch, if you take pictures, you can have three uh, 6.5K uh, resolution. If you take video, you only have 6K. So you have higher resolution if you take picture. And second, most importantly, you can avoid motion blur if you take pictures. Um, but taking pictures labors. Uh, just imagine that you need to use this kind of tripod and take a, take a picture and take it uh, and take it away and uh, walk another one meter or two meter, put it put it on the ground and take another picture and do it for a large space. This is quite laborious, right? And 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 in practice, sometimes the the point of using this physicistic pipeline is to is to be efficient to support a large space. But anyway, this is your choice. If you if you are shooting a video, then we need to uh, uh, then we need to extract the frames from the video. Okay, and also if you're shooting video, you need to make sure that you walk steady and slowly. Uh, don't accelerate or stop immediately. You just make sure that the the, the video quality because in the in the end we need to extract the frame from video. And also. Um, do not do the mapping on rain day or snowy day. Uh, just to be careful of the weather. And yeah, uh, I don't want to read out all the tips here, but I will share the slides. We will make the slide public later. And most importantly, when you, before you start mapping, you need to properly need to plan your route. Uh, well, it depends on where you are going to map. Uh, are you going to map an urban area? or are you going to map an uh, open area? For example, for this kind of urban area, which means that, uh, which means that there are a lot of buildings around and properly needs to plan the trip, plan the, a road to make sure there are some loops. And the best way is doing like what I mark here in the yellow, uh, yellow line here. You just walk, you just cover uh, each city block, uh, each street, street block one by one having loop for each street block, and then in the end, come back to the starting point. And if it's, uh, if you're going to, if you're mapping an open area, uh, technically speaking, you can just walk for free, freely. I mean, but the very, the, the very basic principle is, uh, well, this applies to, to all. It, it doesn't, uh, this, this, this applies to a physics camera, this applies to a mapper, this applies to polycam, this applies to where to go. The very first basic rule for mapping is that you need to think, you need to consider uh, uh, what the ultimate user, where, they were, where the ultimate user is going to stand and where they're going to put their camera towards. So when doing the mapping, you need to, your action, your behavior, your role should be aligned with the ultimate user. And, and also there are some tips like uh, when you do the mapping, please do not rotate the camera too frequently because the rotating the camera could cause some dirty effect and which has, um, which means that your the frame will not, will probably be blurred. Okay. Then if you're shooting a video, you need to uh, export the video in this kind of uh, panoramic flat view, and which I show here, and uh, and please make sure the highest quality if it's acceptable, because um, well the best choice is to use the format ProRes, but sometimes the ProRes ProRes will generate a huge file, which uh, which could be could be not working on your computer computer, but then you can downgrade to other codecs like H264. And when you extract the frame, you can uh, just, well, we have a script uh, to, we have a script for extracting the frame from the video. And, and it's supposed to uh, extract the frames from multiple videos. And this is just a simple script. And you can do also do it uh, by your own. And after that, you can just uh, import the, uh, images into meta shape and then you start uh, photo alignment here i have meta shape open and this is the empty object uh, empty project i can show you that here i have uh, prepared a few images uh, existing images 
uh, each one looks like this. I, I took the images just uh, in a street block beside my home. So I have in total 420 images here. So I'll, what I would do is that I would just drag them all into a shape. And then it's to set the uh, camera calibration and it's to set the images images type very cool. Um, then what I would do is just to click this align photo, align photo. And then it will start uh, doing alignment based on the images that, uh, that provides. It will take a long time. It will take a long time according to how power for your computer is. If you have a very good video card, maybe take just a snap. But now I will just stop it. Okay. So, uh, so when you import the video, when you import the uh, uh, photos, also you need to be noticed that uh, it is about the coordinate system, and um, by default, the, the coordinate system is WGS84, which means all the markers is is only to suppose the latitude and longitude, but you need to change to local coordinates. And after the alignment, but well, the alignment is the most important part in this pipeline. After alignment, that means to uh, from the SFM process of beta shape. And after alignment, you have this point plot generated. And then is to what you can do, what you, what you can do further, generate the mesh and generate the texture. Double check the quality of the point cloud, the quality of the mesh, the quality of the texture. Sometimes you see that some part is missing from the point cloud. Sometimes you see some part is misaligned from the mesh. Then probably you need to realign photo. If that if that doesn't fix, you map the area. And also this is important that um, when you have the when you have the point cloud generated. When you have the mesh generated, now you have the point cloud or you have the mesh, you have the model, but the and, oh, sorry, the beta you understand the scale, the polygon shape does not really so we need to fix the scale. So now you have the model, but the scale is not as same as the physical scale. So we need to fix the scale. To fix the scale, a refer project. Which means that you can find you need to find the object which you find with the dimensions known. Uh, for example, in, uh, we can find this kind of tile on the ground, and if we measure the tiles, then this kind of one of the first set of reference. Add a few markers uh, based on the tile. Uh, for example, uh, if the length of it is 2.8. The, of the side is 2.8 meters of each tile. We can add a few points like this A, B, C mark there. And we can set the points as the region, like 0, 0, 0. Then uh, another two points, the, 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 the position, and the other point, two points is known based on the measurements. And by doing this, we fix the scale. Of the, we can fix the scale of the point cloud and the scale of the mesh. And at the same time, we find the system, which means the orientation of the whole coordinate system. So it's the best to add, uh, the, the, at least you need to add three, mar three markers, at least. But the more you add, the, the, the more accurate or reliable the, the scale can be. For example, sometimes we better, well, if it's possible, better find vertical data as well. I mean, X, Y, Z, if you can find some vertical element, it, yeah, um, if you can find some points which is scattered for the point that has y, y axis, that's very good. If you if it's hard to find that kind of point, then you'd better, you'd better add, add uh, more points. Uh, for example, this is uh, what about here is uh, like a garden. I added six points, six markers here. Um, just to 
if you have more more points, there's less chance you have uh, to be inaccurate, let's say. And please be noticed that uh, meta calling the system of meta shapes is different from Unity. The calling the system of meta shape is right hand system and system, whereas Unity is left hand. So just be aware of this when you add decisions. And then the most important part here is that we need to generate the camera pose. Uh, we were talking about camera pose, camera pose. So, so the most important thing we need from this photo, photogrammetry is the camera pose. And to get the most accurate and reliable camera pose, we need to uh, deal, we need to do some optimization on the point cloud first. So you can delete some of the points, which is obviously inherited first, and then you need to uh, change some of the value. In meta shape, there there is this graduate selection feature which allows the points point clouds. So just an explanation of this. So here, this uh, what we are doing here is that um, when you have the point cloud, the point cloud there are points in this point, cloud, but not every points are accurate. So what we are doing here is to delete those. Uh, inaccurate points and only leave the accurate points. And some accurate points, we, we we do camera optimization. And theoretically, in this way, we can make sure of the camera, make sure that the 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 camera and the camera pose generated is very accurate because it's only based on accurate points. Okay. So after, after you do some unnecessary points, then uh, you generate the camera. Point. Uh, camera pose maximum and meta shape. And then so now you have the now you have the XML camera pose and on the other side you have the images. And then you which is the camera side you have the image. You need to uh, convert the data to be like one image, one camera pose, one image, one camera pose like this. And if you are if you are using MetaShape, we have a sample script that allows you to convert the MetaShape generated uh, camera pose to this format: one image, one camera pose. If you are using some other uh, photogrammetry uh, software, you can do it on your own as well. And then you can use our script to, to upload this uh, the, the images plus camera pose to Immersive Backend to start map construction using our API. And when you have a uh, when you have map generated, you can start a mapper app on site. Uh, you can clean the map by using immersive app. Uh, just load the map and then start testing. That's it. And localization. Also. Uh, as I mentioned, that one of the side effects, a good side effect from this physics pipeline, is that this photo texture, and this moves in Unity for adding up air contents for development. Uh, sorry, I don't know why. Okay, seems seems fine. Sorry, there was some alert picking me up, saying my network is having a problem, but should be fine. Okay, let's continue. So yeah, then you can use the. Mesh plus texture in Unity for AR development. And what you need to do is you can export the model and export the texture from Metashape. And then you can just throw it into, into Unity and you should be able to see a model. And the coordinate system should be aligned to uh, what you just defined when you add up the, when you add in the, the markers. Yeah. 
Yeah, this is uh, the last step, which is optional, is that uh, you may choose to optimize the map generated with our map editing feature. And I think this part has been covered in the previous uh, session, so I will be fast. So basically, that means that you can uh, download the map generated and edit the map with third-party map editing tool, for example, Met, uh, Mesh Lab. Um, and then you can delete the unnecessary points. Uh, for example, one typical use case can be that um, if you are mapping a park, uh, properly you, you, you get the, uh, the point cloud, properly you get a lot of points of the trees in the park. And the trees are usually problematic for localization. And they have a lot of features, but the leaves are always moving. So we can remove the trees in point clouds to, to, to kind of like optimize the point clouds. So what you can do is that in mesh lab, you can delete the trees, the points from the trees, and then you have the new point clouds here. You may upload the new point clouds to immersive backends, and, and there's going to be a new job created. And, and, in the, and then you, ha you have a new map generated with all the trees. Yeah, uh, this is optional. So yeah, this is the overview of the 360 pipeline. If you have any, if you have any question, please just type in chat and so that we can answer. Thank, <clears throat> Thank you very much, Marlene. That was really detailed and, and good explanation of the 360 pipeline. As already mentioned multiple times, it is a question that we get a lot. And now finally we have like extensive uh, answer, yeah, how it goes and when it may be useful and when it is not. Um, I have a couple of questions. I'm just checking now the questions box. We don't have questions there yet, but you still have time to write them down if you want. But I have a question for both of you. First for Maolin, um, about this 360 pipeline, um, is there any customer case uh, where somebody has already used this uh, that you can mention that what, what type of project this has been used in? Yeah, uh, the 360 pipeline has been very popular for the users in China because the use case in China is usually for mapping a large space, outdoor map, a lot outdoor large space, such as a park, such as a, a town or a shopping uh, or a shopping street, commercial street, uh, yeah, something like that. And um, because if you're comparing to this 360 pipeline, if you normally if you do it with Snapper tool, you can also do that. But yeah, but considering the scale of the of the space could be quite laborious. I mean, if you take pictures one by one, it could, could take a long time to, for you to collect data to do the mapping. But with Swiss camera, you can just load up the camera and just take a walk, and that's it. But Swiss camera is still not as efficient as, uh, let's say, be okay to go or a laser scanner. Because just remember this, do you remember uh, just by, by looking at this pipeline, you see that the mapping itself. Take is very efficient. It only take a short time, but after that, it take a, still take hours for processing the data. Uh, and today we don't have time to 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 really wait in the meta shape to process data because that take hours. So usually for photo alignment, it take a few hours, well, depending on how many pictures are there and there are, depending on how or let's say depending on how how much how long the the video is. But usually it takes between one hour to like uh, several hours for, for map alignment. And after that map alignment, it take another few hours for generating the mesh, for generating the texture. So in total, maybe one day is needed for, 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 the, for, the, for, the, for this in this pipeline after the shooting, after shooting the video or taking, taking pictures. So, so it's less efficient than be okay to go, but the mapping itself is not, not that laborious. It's be okay to go since you don't need to do post-processing work, and you have the you have the camera pose 
from the device directly. So that's more that's much more efficient than than this. But yeah, still because the, still there are a lot of use cases, uh, especially in China, because this is very good for outdoor situation because also this device is very cheap. And we are we are now talking about consumer level physicality devices, and though, which are usually just like a few hundred US dollar, which are very cheap and affordable. Yeah, okay. there are many uses. Thank you very much, Marlin. That that's that's a good understanding a little bit how, where where this has been used already. Um, yeah. Then my question to Avice. The last example that you showed, or the the question that people have been asking, was about stadiums, and you were showing quite nice picture of the stadiums and and explaining us a little bit of how to map that that those kind of stadiums. Of course, from the user's point of view, because the user can be anywhere on the stadium, then you need to have a lot of viewpoints captured. Um, what would your estimation be? How long should uh, should be reserved? How long time should be reserved for mapping of the stadium? Like well, that? It yeah, it depends on the device you are mapping with, and also the size of the stadium. Like if has if it is only like one, it has only one deck, like one trade deck. You can just like walk into diagonal uh, lines. And you can just walk slowly, just like uh, I, uh, I tell the customers, just like you're holding a cup of tea and you have to walk steady like that. So, so the water don't drop. So you have to walk steady uh, uh, along the staircase from the up from up to down. And uh, all the staircase, if they are like, uh, you know, uh, maybe they are like 20 feet apart from each other. And also then uh, you can, uh, skip few steps like five to six steps and then walk again in a circle so you will have horizontal and vertical walking pattern and uh, you of course you don't have to map from each and every seat or every point of view so our technology does it for you so uh, you, you are uh, walking from stairs case from top to down and also in circles uh, so uh, it depends on the device like if you are mapping with a cell phone it can take a lot of time uh, if, but if you are using with BLK to go, it will be much quicker. Yeah, so that's that's a good good guidance for how how much people should yeah. look for and, for the mapping. Also, I would uh, like to add one more thing about uh, regarding Mao's last uh, last optional thing uh, about map editing. Not that now we have added documentation on our. Uh, 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 website and you can watch tutorial or you can also go to the YouTube to uh, number three uh, map clinic. So you can have uh, uh, a look at that in detail and also our limited tutorial and the written documentation is available on our website. So you are free to check it out. Exactly, that's very good as, as well. There's updated documentation and YouTube videos about the mat, map editing uh, feature definitely you should check that out. Thank you very much. I've checked the chat box and the questions box and I see a question there. Um, the question is, would it make a difference if mapping empty stadium and tracking when it is packed with viewers? Well, uh, it is better to map the empty stadium because you will have, you will have all, uh, no noise in it. So you don't know the stadium will be fully packed or half packed or what feature will be visible. So it is better to map the empty stadium. And uh, uh, as long as you are looking at the features, for example, the pitch is now going to change or maybe uh, the scoreboard uh, like the features around it or uh, you know there are a lot of features that don't change a lot so if they stay same it will look like perfectly but it is recommended to map it without the people so the people if they're walking around it will create a lot of noise so it's better that you can visit like one day before the game and uh, map it or a few days ago if it's going to stay same 
but it is not recommended to map people with within it. But once it, it, it is mapped, so it, it will apply definitely. Thanks. Just Bye -bye. Com yeah, just one comment for that question as well for mapping the stadium. Um, I think one one thing important is that for stadium is a challenging you know, space because uh, on stadium uh, for the situation where there are a lot of audience and for the situation where it is empty, it, look, it looks quite different, right? Because there are a lot of people and it look, looks quite different. And uh, as I was mentioned, it's best to map, uh, it's best to start with when it's empty. And also another thing important is that you'd better focus your mapping uh, mainly towards the field uh, instead of the seats. The field, I mean the center of the stadium. And usually in the field, there are some lines like red line. It depends on which type of city or stadium it is for football or baseball or whatever. Usually there are some lines and the best way is to, to map for that part. And the localization, it's best to have the localization towards the, the field instead of the seats. And uh, because the seats part could be dynamic when, 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 when there are people. Perhaps. Yes, That's thank you, Molly. Point. Good point as well. I don't see any more questions. Uh, I will say thank you for our experts, Avais and Maulin. And uh, I recommend you guys to register for the next one as well. We will have new topics in the next mapping clinic in one month's time. Uh, you will receive an email with the uh, link to the rec recording. So you can go back and have a look. Um, and I say thank you. It was nice that you joined the Immersal Mapping Clinic number four today. I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next ones as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.